you, you have to answer three questions in, in your career, right? How fast can I learn? How much can I give to others? And can I take a punch? And if you can answer those three questions, you can do almost anything in your life. Welcome, Jeff. Great to have you on. Hey, Eric. Thanks. Great to be here. Great to great to uh, meet you. And I look forward to the conversation. Yeah, and uh, just right off the bat, let's give people you know an appreciation for the scope of what you were leading. I mean, GE. Give us some numbers. Like, what was um, you know market cap at the height during your 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 sixteen years as CEO. Um, you know, number of employees, maybe how many geographies were, were you in? How yeah, look, so, yeah, you know, it was kind of like the classic industrial and financial conglomerate. So uh, probably at its peak, you know, market cap through, you know, close to $400 billion, uh, wow. 185 countries, 330,000 employees. Uh, we would do everything from jet engines to media to pet insurance. Uh, we had 26 countries that we had more than a billion dollars of revenue. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, uh, uh, probably the most highly regulated company in the world. Uh, yeah, no, it was uh, it was like uh, incredible scope. You know, my my uh, predecessor said to me when we were kind of going through a transition, he said, you know, Jeff, look, you're never going to go home uh, because your work is done, right? You're going to go home because you're tired or you want to see your family, or you're stressed out. But for as long as you do this job, you will never have a minute that you're not going to feel stress. Yeah. And you know, after 16 years, I can say he was 100% right. He actually underestimated how stressful it was. Yeah, so and, that, and, and, <laughs> and I think a lot of people might know the predecessor that you're referring to, if you yeah. wouldn't mind naming. Uh, yeah, my Jack Welch was my was my yeah. uh, so so in so I basically took over for him in 2000, 2001. Yeah, and and as we were going through the transition, he was voted by Fortune magazine as the best manager of the previous century. Right. Wow. So you, <laughs> you're taking over, and you kind of sit there and say, "Well, those are those are let's those are interesting shoes to fill." Right? Yeah. Well, so, yeah, but uh, you know, you were also by Barron's uh, uh, name, uh, yeah. I think, three times, right? The world's best, you know, amongst your know, world's best CEOs, right? Yeah. No, it's it's look, it's uh, you know, Eric, as you know, like. Uh, you're never as good as they say on your best day or as bad as they say you're on your worst day. Yeah, so you're yeah. better off just keeping your head down, taking shit when you have to take shit and just keep <laughs> doing your job. I mean, that's really what life is all about, right? Amazing. So, yeah. so before we, we hit record, we were talking about how we're doing you know, quite similar things at the moment in that you know, we both have our kind of advisory and investment portfolios yeah. and, and focus on you know, helping... Um, these smaller, you know, companies and, and CEOs and leadership teams kind of scale up their businesses. And, and when we were talking uh, just now, you, you know, you mentioned how, well, I like to, you know, just only invest and, and stick to, to what I know. And then it just dawned on me when you talked about the scope of GE, uh, all those different businesses, um, how did you feel, you know, comfortable managing so many different, you know, as a conglomerate, so many different types of businesses like that? Yeah, you know, look, so I, I never really viewed that we were kind of a classic holding company. So we were more of an operating company than a holding company. So I knew, a lot, you know, I, I knew, I knew at the end of the day, I knew a lot about a lot of things. Mm. Um, but you had to pick really good people. You, you had to really stay focused on talent and capital and risk and things like that. Uh, but look, you know, to a certain extent, we were in too many things when I became CEO. And right. you never know that, you know, Eric, until things get choppy. You, you know, in other words, when in the late 90s or when things are good, like they've been the last, let's say, five years, right? Not today, but the last five years. You know, you confuse tailwind with good management. Right, you, you you confuse like when things are good, and then when when the shit hits the fan, you know, you sit there and say, "Gosh, I really don't know as much about insurance as I thought I knew." Right, yeah. or I don't know as much about media as I thought I knew, or things like that. So I I, I think I think you, you always have to test yourself, right, with respect to like 
do I have the, the best people? Do I really know as much as I, I think I know? And, and so I'm pretty good today, you know, of, of like really testing for, do we really know the domain, right? Do we really have the right talent people and things like that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like your comment about, um, you know, the, the choppy waters, you know, I, I relate it to parenting. It's, it's uh, you, you, you can't really judge your own or someone else's parenting ability until you see how they handle the children when they're having a tantrum, right? You know, cause yeah. it's, it's easy to parent when the kids are well behaved. It's a lot yeah. harder when the kids are all over the place, right? So yeah, yeah, no, no, it's a, you know, I, I say frequently, every job looks easy till you're the one doing it, right? Yeah. So so now there's probably 15 GE CEOs that are within 50 miles of where I sit right now, right? Yeah. And I look at them going through troubles right now, yeah. and I I grab them by the arm and say, look. It looked easier when I was doing it, didn't it. When you were criticizing me, it looked a lot easier than it does now that you're doing it in the middle of a recession and things like that. So I think it's just, you know, as you know, like management is so much just about learning, observing, learning, making mistakes, getting better, staying yeah. humble. Exactly. And, and it just is such this thing of... Um, you know, I say to my business school students that you really, you, you have to answer three questions in, in your career, right? How fast can I learn? Mm -hmm. How much can I give to others? And can I take a punch, right? Can I, can I take a punch and get up? And if you can answer those three questions, you can do almost anything in your life. But, you know, most people can't answer those three questions, right? Most people stop learning. They're not, they don't treat other people well. And when they get hit in the nose 10 times, they finally say, I just can't do this anymore. Well, it's I like it, it anymore, you know, but and that's last, enough, I quit. Yeah, the last point is, you know, it's especially important, you know, we, we, we know Mike Tyson's quote, right? Everyone has a yeah, plan exactly. to get punched in the mouth. And, um, and what you're saying there is that, um, you know, in a way, it's like Marcus Aurelius in his, uh, you, know, you know, journal meditations, he, he says something along the lines of, it's not that you have to avoid the knockdowns in life, it's the game to play is how quickly can you stand back up, you know, it's like yeah. the knockdowns are going to be inevitable, right? Yeah. Um, and that's a good segue to day two, you take over as CEO, we're going back now to uh, the year is 2001, and um, you, you even talk about this in your uh, incredible book, you know, Hot Seat, which is your, your memoir about uh, leadership in times of crisis. So, yeah, Jeff, what happens? Day two, what goes on? You know, so, you know, Eric, I, I wrote my book really for two reasons. You know, one is to really memorialize what it felt like to lead through crisis. Mm -hmm. And the other one was that, you know, I, I've just been often criticized and the company has been often criticized. And I, I wanted to show leaders that, look, you can be accountable for criticism, but you don't have to hide, right? You, 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 can, you can learn and you can get better and you can be honest and you can add context. And in fact, you should add context on behalf of your team. And that, that's really why I wrote the book. So day two, I, 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 I basically, for the first 20 years of my career, I had been through recessions, but I'd really never had a bad day. You know, in other words, I'd really never seen tail risk or things like that. And then while I was CEO, I saw 9-11, the financial crisis, Fukushima nuclear disaster, just kind of wave after wave. And I, I think, you know, I, I learned some important lessons uh, about crisis that, you know, in, in a crisis, a leader has to learn how to absorb fear, that, that you have to you, you can't be a multiplier of bad things, right? You, you need to be transparent, but you also need to show people a, a way forward. Yeah. You need to kind of triage uh, dysfunction, right? If, if people are pointing fingers or things like that, you need to kind of uh, stop that and you need to kind of put a, a, a rope around that. You need to simplify everything. You need to simplify metrics and and kind of work on getting one kind of win at a time. Um, and can you take us through specifically, um, you know, the crisis that you had to endure, you know, on that second day of taking over the CEO? Yeah, so, so on the second day, so we had, um, 
on the when 9-11 happened, you know, you, you weren't sure that the commercial aviation business would ever survive again, right? So you you didn't know that planes would ever fly again. And at that moment in time, we had a 50% market share of aircraft engines. We owned 1,200 aircraft through our leasing business. We insured, we had 100% of the insurance on World Trade Center 7, right? Uh, and we owned NBC, who went without commercials for an entire week, right? So we were like in the middle of every disaster uh, you could imagine. And what, so, what, what did that tally, that bill? Uh, probably $2 billion of operating earnings just, in the, just from the get-go. And another probably $7 billion of potential write-offs if airlines went bankrupt and things like that. So you begin the triage process, right? You begin to kind of say, okay, what's, let's, let's get uh, the write-off for World Trade Center 7 established. Let's get a working team with the airlines. Let's start meeting every night at 8 p.m. and deciding uh, how we're gonna treat the airlines around the world. How much money can we lend them? How do we keep them supported, who's going to go to the government to try to get a bailout for the airlines, mm -hmm. uh, what we communicate to the teams around, you know, in other words, the healthcare business was fine. Okay, so call the CEO of the air, aircraft business and say, or the healthcare business and say, don't call me for a month, okay, because I got 17 other problems, you're not one of them, you know, so you, you begin to triage the uh, the the crisis, and you you kind of learn over time, you know, kind of what the what the problems are and how best to communicate. And I, I think at the end of the day, you want to hold two truths, right? You want to say things can get worse, and you want to describe to people that things can get worse. And at the same time, you want to say there's going to be a future, and we want to be part of the future, and, and probably. A year after 9-11, then SARS happens, right? So then, you know, kind of the precursor for COVID, which was called SARS, that also set the airline industry back. And at the very same time, Alan Mulally, who kind of ran Boeing's commercial division, at that very moment, he launches the 787, which nobody in the industry wanted to do, right? But it was his way to say, there's going to be a future. I'm going to design a modern airplane that can fly Sydney to New York City nonstop. And it was almost like a symbol that said this industry is going to be back on its feet again, right? So absorb fear, triage, get immediacy around the experts that know uh, what's going on, you know, embrace an imperfect team. Like investors were immediately saying, why do you own so many aircraft? Well, you weren't asking me that question the week yeah, before 9-11, right? Yeah. So, you know, you know, this guy that's running your aircraft business, he's a jerk, you should fire him. Well, that's not really true. You know, he's actually excellent. That team's gonna help us work our way through this. They're actually heroes. They're yeah, not who, terrible. Who, 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 could great. who could have predicted 9-11, right? And the, you know, so it's 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 you have to them. kind of embrace and perfect. The last thing I would say, Eric, it's the difference between being an operator and an investor. Uh, you know, in, in COVID, I'm on the other side of the table, I'm an investor now. And you hear investors say to their CEOs, cut deep and cut once. Okay. Mm -hmm. I grab the CEO after the meeting and say, don't listen to that, okay? Ah, interesting. See, Why do you say see that? What's go, see what's going on, because if you cut, you know, get more information, see what's going on. This may bounce back fast. You know, the reason why we don't have enough chips right now is because people cut deep and cut once. You know, people, everybody cut deep and cut once. So we can't, we don't have enough cars. We don't have enough refrigerators. We have shortages on everything. I, I think, I think what you really want to do in a crisis is you want to make those decisions you have to make when you have to make them, you know, when, yeah, when and I think this, this goes back to, uh, cause I really like what you, your, your, your point from a communication point of view of, of, of saying, um, you know, gathering everyone and saying, Hey, this, this is going to get worse. Yeah. Uh, but we, we will, we will rally ourselves to a, better There's a future. future. It will get better. Right. 
And so you're kind yeah. of opening up, you know, scope for not having to cut once, you know, and cut deep, you know, because things could get worse and you might have to revisit this, right? Yeah, that's what the, that would say, you know, when Lehman Brothers went bankrupt in the financial crisis, there were, there were just like seven waves of horribleness, right? So, mm -hmm. so if you would, like the day Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, if you said to your team, cut deep and cut once, you would miss the tidal wave that was going to come over you. What you really had to say to your team is, get ready to cut 72 times. And yeah. I, don't know what the, I don't know what the next 70 looked like. So just get ready. Yeah, well, what you really have to say to people is stay, stay flexible, stay calm. We're going to learn more, and as we learn more, we're going to adapt and change. But we're going to work on this together. It uh, doesn't matter how we got here, okay? We're going to learn as we go along. It doesn't matter. We're we're not going to point fingers. We're going to sort our way through this. We're going to get through it, but we're we're going to learn and get better and make the decisions we need to make when we need to make them. Yeah, and I think just communicating, over communicating with the team, right, is just is just critical, especially in. Yeah. in this crisis time. So I, I, I'm super curious. I'm sure, you know, some of the listens that listener, listeners are too. How does one go about becoming, you know, the CEO of a, a company that's, you know, at, at the time worth in the hundreds of, of billions? Like, can you take us, you know, was this, was it always your dream to, you know, be leading an organization of that size? Um, and, you know, what were the steps that you took to make that happen? You know, it was never, it was never my dream. Um, it was always like, I, I think I decided early in my life, or let's say when I was graduating business school, I decided that I was going to try as hard as I could. You know, I, I decided I was gonna give everything I could to be as good of a business person as I could be and let that take me wherever it could take me. I happened to join GE and, and it was a really magical time and I had a, a tremendous, you know, managers and- What did uh, you join I, I, as? I joined as, uh, uh, as in the GE's plastics business as a product manager. So I spent the early parts of my career in the plastics business and sales and marketing jobs and things like that. Um, you know, so it's, it's, uh, that, you know, I kind of learned, years, like what, what was that journey like? So you joined, so, the, so I was in the plastics business for like, uh, seven or eight years. And then I was in the appliance business for four years. Then I was back in the plastics business for four years. Then I ran the healthcare business for five years. So again, I did various jobs. I, I learned kind of how to do a function and how to run a business. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I learned globalization. I, I learned technology. Um, you know, but you, there's no, and I, I'd been through cycles and all that stuff, but you know, Eric, there's no prep for how to be a CEO. You, you know, in other words, you do the best you can. You you get different experiences. You 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 get good well well train. You know, you get good training, and and you get good experiences. It's just the difference between running a division and being CEO is just such a such a dynamic step. So, you know, you need a good board to, to kind of help you through it, and you've got to have um, you know some good peers and a little bit of luck to make that step. What, what, what are the top skills in your mind to, to be a successful CEO? What are the things that you need? You to know, so for the last, um, the last five years, I've taught a course at Stanford where we've had 12 CEOs each year come in, six legacies, six startups. And I'd say um, conviction, you know, that whether you're running a startup or a big company, You've got to you've got to have a real sense for you know who who you are what you do yeah you've got to have connection you've got to have the ability to you know connect with people inside and outside the company I think really critical you've got to be focused you know in other words you 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 just can't you know if you sit and listen to we had like. Ed Bastian, who's the CEO of Delta, you know, and he's talking to 80 business school students, but, and he's talking about running a really complicated airline, but you know, what comes out of his mouth is like three things that are important. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> and the students hear that, you know, they, they actually like, it, it's just, you know, a hundred words, but really like three things that he's working on that, that are important. So you, you gotta be focused. I think- um, which, which of the skills of what you've mentioned so far, which, which, um, which, which were the ones that, you know, which was the one that you had to work on or develop the most personally? Oh, I, I think, um, I always think that focus for me was the hardest. Yeah. And when you focus, say focus, focus you for mean, me, you know, again, just like, um, like, do you mean like day, like on a day to day basis? Like, no, but like, how do you keep a new idea, particularly with a big company? How do you keep a new idea from coming out of your mouth? Right. Or, or, or how do you say, you know, I, I decided that, uh, George um, needs to get fired, but if I fire him today, it's going to be more disruptive for the organization. I should wait nine months. Sometimes I was just too impulsive, right? Sometimes I was just too impulsive. And so I, I just think, you know, I, I, I always had conviction. I, I was always pretty humble. I was really well connected in the organization. I was pretty transparent with the organization, but sometimes I was just too impulsive. Right. And that and that and that can lead to a lack of discipline. So if I was would flaw myself or if I would criticize myself on things I see other good leaders do that I, I'm envious of, that would be that would be the piece that I'd say I see in other good leaders that I wish I was better at. And so how did you how did you remedy that then? Like how did you, you gotta surround yourself with people that can walk in your office and say, Hey, shut the fuck up! Well, you're, you're, you're confusing. <laughs> you're confusing people. You're confusing people. You're, you're all over the place. It's like with it's, too much shit, right? You're confusing people with too many things. You gotta stop. So the, I think that's true with everybody. Like, there's nobody that's really good at like all five things that it takes to be great. Yeah. And yeah. so you you gotta have somebody that can come. And by the way. There's some people that aren't good at any of the five. You know, I've had some CEOs in my class who you sit there. So I always spend the first 15 minutes of the next class critiquing the CEO they just saw as part of the learning. But I, I put a positive spin on it. Like, and there's sometimes they say, like, what do you see that you like? And no hands go up, right? Yeah. And, and you, you kind of sit there. So, but but sometimes um, you know, and, and I would say like. The, the most fatal flaw is no conviction, right? Mm -hmm. So in other words, you just cannot lead if you don't believe in anything. You just cannot. Yeah. And, and, and unfortunately, sometimes you don't see that until it's, until it's too late. So some of these are fatal, but, but I think all, all people need compensation with the team. Yeah. All people need some compensation with the team. So typically it would be my CFO, who would come in and just say, look, we're just not ready for this. You just have to shut up. Hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How about um, um, academics? I mean, they've been a big, very big part of your life, right? Yeah. So, um, and you, you, you went to some you know, great schools. You, know, you got, um, I think you got your, your bachelor's from Dartmouth and um, MBA from Harvard, right? Um, and, um, and then academic, you're still you know, involved in the academic uh, world, you know, you know, these days as well. Um, I'm a big fan of university. I'm encouraging, you know, both of my boys to, to, to do the whole university thing. But it's interesting. Yeah, you know, I, I hear the you know, traditional like education route, I'd say is definitely under attack these days. You know, a lot of people are saying, well, why would you even bother getting an MBA? You know, just get out there and, you know, you can even skip university. What's, what's your view? Do you think the educational system needs to kind of update or change with these times? You know, how are things different in your mind? Oh gosh, I think it's, it's a super complicated question. And I have, I have to say my own thoughts are a little bit complicated right now. So I don't, I don't even know that I can articulate because some of it is, some of it is professional, some of it is social in terms okay. of, so, you know, I'd say if, if, if our passion is to solve big problems like affordable health care or uh, climate change or things like that, yeah. you know, we need more smart people. Like, like people need to get, people need to understand physics and business and uh, uh, capital allocation. And these are big, you know, you know, we call our course systems leadership because 
to solve what I saw in my career is to solve big problems like climate, you need to align public policy and technology and capital markets and things like mm -hmm. that. And that's what I wanted to teach, right? And that's only going to happen in university. Yeah. Uh, some of the big problems we have in, in the world today are really um, social, are, are really uh, uh, class, you know? So mm -hmm. I was flying from East Coast to West Coast. I stopped in Wichita because two of my old colleagues run aviation companies that are headquartered in Wichita. And I wanted to walk through their factories and meet with their teams and just spend a day there. And mm -hmm. one of the things I realized is that those teams don't intersect at all with Stanford, where I was going to teach. That none of the kids at Stanford would ever think about working there. That none of the people who worked there, who were fine American business people, would think anybody at Stanford would ever help them in any way. And so that's a problem. Like I don't view that as I don't view that as like a good thing for society. I don't view that so. So that education, helping those people isn't working in the world today. So I, I think in some ways, education has never been more important than it is today. In some ways, elite education is becoming more disconnected from the vast majority of the way people kind of view their lives and want to live their lives. Yeah, and that has to be that has to be that has to be, you know, a third of my students are going to work in private equity. A third of my students are going to go on Web3, and a third are going to go to work on Wall Street. And I love them all. They're amazing. They're so much better than I was. Yeah. But I kind of find myself scratching my head saying, what's the meaning of life? You know, what's really, what's really, you know, what a, what, what, what what's, a great, what's the meaning of life? You know, what, what a great question. What do you, what do you, what, what's your view on that? What do you think it is? I think we, we, there has to be some recalibration take taking place and that I, I i've loved my time in silicon valley but again i come back to what are the great problems mm. that have to be solved for our children your children and my daughter mm -hmm. we're not solving those problems we're going through the motions we talk about them but you know look if if um if you want to solve climate Exxon has to become a hydrogen company in the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen in Houston, not San Francisco, period, full stop. Okay. Uh, 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 Stat oil has to become Equinor, and Equinor has to become a world leading uh, sequestration company, not oil company. That's how it's going to get solved. So it's going to happen in Bergen and not um, London. Yeah. So that's, that's, and that's where I think, you know, we're just like, we're just chopping wood. We just have no idea what we're doing, who we're, what we're talking about. And, and, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm optimistic because we have so many smart people around, but there's going to have to be some recalibration that takes place. Sure. And for, 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 for the aspiring, you know, business minds who are you know, watching and or listening um, who maybe want to go after some of these problems. Of course, in order to do that, you need to take whatever your ideas are and, uh, and then scale them into proper businesses. When we think about scaling, in your experience, what are the, um, what are the key things that need to happen to scale a business successfully? And then on the flip side, um, what are the things that tend to go wrong or the pitfalls to avoid when scaling a business, what's your view on that? Yeah, look, I mean, I think so. If you if you ask me, so if you said, what's the what's the one singular thing that the business world should take away from Jack Welch? Mm -hmm. He knew how to run a bit a company at size better than anybody I've seen uh, before and after, right? And so I think he did a couple of things really well. He he created an aura of an association. So if you say, what's one thing you should, you, you need to create, whether you're a small company, whether you're a small company that wants to be big or a big company that wants to stay relevant and small, you've got to, you've got to create a sense of, you want to belong together. So he did that. He knew how to instrument a company. You no, know, in other words, consistent accountability, you know, what was good, 
everybody was held to a standard that was good. You know, what makes Amazon work is that Bezos treats everybody the same way. Some people say it's bad. He treats everybody poorly, but he treats everybody and he always has had a standard of excellence that everybody had to meet the same way with Tim Cook and Apple. So, so there's that. A tremendous amount of discipline around focus, right? That's if you want to scale, you have to do things sequentially. So, so you've got to be willing to do that. You have to have a very strong sense that people are important, right? So, so Welch was the first guy that really believed in human resources. And if you say, what's one of the reasons why we're seeing the great resignation right now? It's because we don't have a good enough human resource people, as many as we need, that are really focused on more than just stock options and recruiting. Yeah. So you've got you've got to be able to do that. And I think the last thing is just this notion of communication, right? The one thing that Welch could do is he he could talk to three hundred thousand people. He could talk to twenty people. He could talk to one person. And he used a different tone of voice. He used different words, different kind of phraseology, and he could get his point across. And, and a lot of times all with entrepreneurs that I work with as they try to grow their company, I work with them on how to, how to work the social architecture of the company, mm -hmm. what kind of meetings to run, mm -hmm. how can they give one-on-one -on -one feedback or how do they run meetings or things like that? Because it turns out those things are really important, right? How do you how do you do a town hall? How do you run a meeting? How do you give feedback? You know, and, and lots of entrepreneurs don't like one-on-one -on -one sessions. You know, and you say, look, you just oh, you, so, can't, so, you, so can't many. A, you, yeah. you can't run a company unless you can tell somebody. You, you know, Eric, you're not doing the job, man. You gotta you gotta do better. You can't run a company if you can't run a meeting. You can't run a company if you can't do a town hall. Mm -hmm. So so here's the three things. You know, you just have to learn. So I, I'd say scaling, you know, I kind of learned from a master and it's small to big, big to small, right? That's how I think about scaling. Yeah. It's uh, interesting what you said that, that last point about the, um, you know, meeting rhythms and everything. Uh, I'm sure you've read um, Andy Grove's uh, yeah. book, High Output Management. And he, you know, he talks about how, uh, cause uh, you know, uh, you, you'll hear a lot of people say, oh, I hate meetings. And and you know, a a Andy in the book says, "Well, yeah, but meetings are the medium of management, right?" Yeah, no, no it's like how else? How else are you gonna, you know, manage people? And when I first meet with uh, with, with with the new CEO that I'm advising, uh, you know, I ask the question: "So, is there a weekly leadership team meeting that happens?" And they might say, um, "Yeah." I'm like, "Does it happen consistently at the same time every single week without fail?" usually and i think what do you mean usually like what 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 are the reasons well i i might have an, an you know something else that comes up what like so, yeah. so what happens then with the weekly team meeting oh well it won't happen that week yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that doesn't work obviously and then um or, or you'll ask a question about you know are you meeting with all of your direct reports you know regularly sometimes sometimes not and again that you know that doesn't work right and uh, or you know, what's the quarterly rhythm like? Do you, you know, do you, do you have that, you know, quarterly offsite? Are you reviewing progress, setting new goals, getting everyone's buy-in to the process? And sometimes, um, and, and without these basics in place though, like- No, 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 I always, this is exactly, I always do that, right? I always do set your own calendar. I say, look, I, I, I ran a company with 330,000 people my assistant, my executive assistant had a college degree, right? She was super smart. Mm -hmm. Never once did she ever schedule me. I always scheduled myself. We would sit together and go through it together, but I was always purposeful about my own time, immensely purposeful about my own time. So you got to do that. And then the other thing I do, Eric, is building a horizontal cohort. So whatever your leadership team is, let's say all your direct reports and their direct reports, Treat them as a horizontal cohort. Build, build them as a unit together so that they, they have a cohesion amongst themselves. Be it, because I always say, look, people will leave a company. They'll leave you, right? 
it's hard for them to leave each other. It's actually, it's actually remarkably hard for them to leave each other. It's actually easy to leave you because sometimes you have to be an asshole to be a good boss, yeah. right? And, and very, any, very few of the tech companies build these horizontal, you know, everything's just become so transactional in the Valley mm -hmm. that they don't take the time to build any kind of what, you know, kind of what I would call horizontal cohort. Yeah. And is there any, any tips or tricks or techniques that you would regularly employ to help build the, you know, the stickiness of that cohort? Yeah, look, I think it's uh, maybe two things. One is physical together time. Mm -hmm. However you create that, not on Zoom. And the other one is one or two things that they work on. To, let them design their own comp plan, right? Mm -hmm. Let them design one or two initiatives that are important to the company. I, I used to let people design their own comp plan. Yeah. You know, just because, you know, look, to be honest with you, you know, I'm 66. I've been doing this now for, you know, however long, 45 years. I've had a different comp plan every year for 45 years. Wow. <laughs> it's like, it's alchemy, you know, in, in its highest form, you know, it's hard to find. So I say, look, you guys do it. You guys tell me what you think is going to be the right motivation for you and for the team. Yeah. And and come back to me and let's and, and and I'll I'll work on it with you and I would do things like that on a regular basis. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. Going back to the scaling question, so we talked about um, some of the things you know from your point of view that are necessary to scale something successfully. What about the flip side of that? Um, like, where where are the typical ways where you you see somebody, not even necessarily where it goes wrong, but they just kind of like end up being stuck in that land of the living dead where they're not properly scaling? Like what, what drives that typically? Yeah, look, I mean, I think it frequently it has to do with just not, you know, I, I'd say two things we already talked about, not being able to hire good first line managers, right? So when I think about, you know, companies going from 10 million to $100 million, let's say yeah. as part of their journey, they just don't know how to hire really good for frontline managers. They they're, they never really hit on the meeting flow that is really you know so that they they're making regular decisions that are moving them forward versus getting trapped into you know uh, those kinds of things. And then I, I just say like general competency. You know, it's they get they get spun up on on initiatives that aren't leading to the success of the business and, and just aren't aren't competent enough to get to get things done you know it's um i work with a company that you know we just went out and did you know kind of a a, a convert just to have enough just to have cash in a crappy market and it was it was choppy you know mm -hmm. And the founder was bitching at me of like, it was a terrible time. Cause I was very forceful. We got to get cash, you know? And it was, it was hard. It was really hard and it, it would, didn't go that well. And he was complaining to me and I said, well, look, dude, we wouldn't have to do this if we were shipping products on time, if our inventory didn't suck. If, you know, if, if the 17 things that we should have been doing, if we'd done all those things, hey, you know, we wouldn't have to do any of this stuff. But be because we weren't doing those things, this is where we have, to, we'll live to play another day. Now let's go back to work on the other things. And, I, and I, I think people get confused, particularly small companies get confused between getting the operations right and the next round of fundraising or other things that are just, again, it's, it's easy for me to be critical because I, I had a big company that had lots of good people. It's hard yeah. with small companies. And so I cut them, Look, you know, my view, and Eric, you've done it the same way, is like my job is to be a helper, not a creator. Yeah. You know, when, when, I, when I joined a company, I, I, I've done enough things in my life uh, that I can pick a swim lane that is helpful. Mm -hmm. My ego is not, I, 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 I have my own balance sheet, you know. I, my ego is not embedded in any company I work with. I really take joy in helping the founder, helping the company, solving problems. Sometimes I'm a salesman. Sometimes I'm a coach. Sometimes I fire other board members. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's whatever whatever role I need to play is the role I play. I'm totally with you on, on that. Uh, 
you know, in this in this phase in life, um, I'm finding that I really, I really, you know, rather than being in the light, I actually really enjoy being in the shadows. You know? No, me too. And, and and just helping, you know, behind the scenes without without even really being, you know, known that it's happening, right? Yeah. And um, and that's 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 kind of exciting and and rewarding and um, um, yeah, super enjoy it. Jeff, it's been, I just got one more question for you. It's been, I really enjoyed the conversation. And, you know, looking back at those 45 years, um, you know, incredible career. I, I love how you took us through, you know, how you started as just, you know, product management and in plastics and you just kept, you know, working around. If you just look back at all that time, um, you know, in the interest of trying to help someone as much as possible, what's the number one thing for you that you would attribute to your success? The number one quality or characteristic or thing that you did? Mm, I'm a learner. I'm a learner. Yeah. You know, I'm just, I'm a, just, you read a lot. I read incessantly, you know, I read probably 70 or 80 books a year. I'm, I'm, wow. a, I'm, a, I'm kind of like, uh, always, uh, why do you do this? How do you do that? Um, what can I, what can I get better at? How do I learn? Que uh, question, question for yeah. you about your reading. I'm just curious when you read, uh, cause that's a, that's a huge volume to get through 70, 80 books. Yeah. Uh, when you read, do you, you know, like read meticulously, you know, underlining, writing notes in the margins, or you just read to get through the book? I think a combination, you know, so I, I, I do, you know, like I read, deep technical things right so i i uh and and those i might take chapters where i go really deep and try to understand or actually even maybe call the author afterwards and and say hey can you actually ex explain to me you know like yeah. what this means um yeah. then i uh but there's some that i you, you know like one of my favorites is uh kind of military history and so those tend to be seven or eight hundred page books <laughs> Wow. You know, so it's What's hard that? to read those. I've never read anything in, in military. Can you give me a recommendation of a good military? Yeah, I'd say there's a, you know, a lot of the books that are about uh, World War II, right? Okay. So I, I find, you know, again, as an American, it's such a, a source of pride. But, it, I, you know, they're such like logistical. If you're a business person, uh, the books about World War II are kind of like this combination of leadership logistics and so as a business person you appreciate it but the reason why i like military history is that it's there's studies of failure and learning from failure right mm -hmm. so you know in the beginning of both the pacific and atlantic wars were like one failure after another mm -hmm. and you know the president was an optimist that just said we're going to get better at this and then you know people learned and got better and you know like business when you guys were doing um skype like you know probably the first three years like nothing worked and yeah. you hated each other <laughs> and like you know and, and so you know we get enthralled with social media and you turn on cnbc and you know particularly like in a time like this and you know jim kramer's calling everybody an asshole and you know yeah. everybody's the you know netflix is horrible you know their days passed and peloton's horrible and you know they're not horrible okay they're 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 people that you know have done really great things and added great service and maybe they'll get better someday you know jeff it's been uh yeah i Really nice chat conversation, yeah, I enjoyed it. but really appreciated your time and uh, really nice meeting. Good luck with everything.